Material Requirements Planning, often called MRP. Today we'll be learning about what MRP is all about, what does it do well, what does it not do well, um, and so on. So let's recap what you have already learned about forecasting and inventory management, because the way to understand MRP is to see what it does differently or where it's used, um, where traditional forecasting inventory management is perhaps not used. When we're doing planning, we often start with a forecast because you have to know how much demand to fulfill to build a plan to fulfill that demand. We saw in sales and operations planning as well that forecasting is crucial. You start with the forecast, then you decide are you going to meet that demand with production or overtime production, outsourcing and things like that. Okay. Um, now in sales and operations planning, a high level forecast at the product category level was often sufficient or for a group of products that had similar production requirements, you could just forecast for that group and then work at a high level um, planning to make sure you had the large resources in place in terms of capacity and so on to be able to meet that demand. MRP operates at a level below that. So after you have a sales and operations plan, typically you'll do MRP material requirements planning after that. In material requirements planning, you're working at the item, sub-assembly, and component level. And this will become clear as we go through the lesson. Now, inventory management policies, we studied continuous review or QR system, where you have you know, a reorder point or periodic review system or SS systems. Um, they all require a demand forecast for some time period into the future uh, to be able to set inventory parameters because all of these policies need D, the level of demand, or demand during lead time to be able to compute those policies. Now, often in the questions we said average demand per day is this. Well, how did we know average demand per day is that? That's coming from the forecast. Okay. So even though it may not be explicitly clear when you just look at inventory management by itself, inventory management, um, continuous review systems, periodic review systems, um, it all runs on an estimate of demand. And typically we need to have that estimate be applicable or hold over at least the lead time um, because then we can change our policies, but at least for the current lead time, we need to be able to, to set inventory properly. And then if the forecast changes, we reset our inventory parameters. Right. Um, and so these uh, methods of forecasting that we have talked about, uh, or you may have studied in an operations management class, like time series based methods, um, or judgment methods, um, and inventory management methods, they all work very well for finished goods. They're actually uh, created thinking about finished goods. So retailers, for example, will use a lot of inventory management methods and forecasting methods because they just deal with finished goods. Finished good is a product that does not require further processing um, to be sold and given to a customer. Okay? Sometimes it may require packaging for shipment, like you order something from Amazon and Amazon packs it up to ship it to you, but the product itself is ready. It's not being produced. It's, you're not buying components to assemble them for the user. The finished good is ready. Okay. Now, the demand for finished goods is often um, called, especially in the MRP world, is called independent demand because it is independent of the production system. Uh, the demand comes from the customer. Customer is outside the production system or the factory, and so the factory cannot read the customer's mind. The factory doesn't know what the demand is. Maybe they can forecast it but it is external to the production facility and the production facility knows of the demand through orders placed by the customers or estimated based on historical data and so forth. So that's called independent demand. It's independent of what you are producing. A customer does not say, okay, give me a Camry because you, I know you are building, I, or I somehow know or I think you're building a Camry. The customer says, I want a Camry because I like XYZ feature. Right. Um, so that's called independent demand. Dependent demand, on the other hand, is demand which depends on what you're producing. So if you're producing a Camry 
and you need four tires to be able to assemble the Toyota Camry, um, then the demand for the four tires will be called dependent demand because it's not coming directly from the customer. It's coming from the fact that you decided to assemble a Camry in your factory. Okay. So here's an illustration of that. So you can see um, demand for vehicles, computers, other finished goods is, you know, for the most part, independent demand. Um, and demand for components that are used to build these finished products is called dependent demand. The main thing to remember is independent demand comes from the end customer. The customer when you know decides to buy or not buy, and that determines the demand for the finished goods. Components are often not bought by the end customer. Components are bought by the manufacturing companies. And the demand for these components arises because a company decides to produce some finished goods. So let's say, you know, GM um, sh decides to produce certain model of a car. Um, and then they say, OK, we need to, you know, make this many transmissions for this car. So the demand for the transmission is dependent demand because it arises from a production decision by GM, not from the end customer, the end user, the person who's going to buy and drive the car. Okay. Now, sometimes end users also buy components. If you have owned a car, you may have bought an air filter or an oil filter uh, to replace that in your car, or you may have bought tires to replace tires that were worn out. And so in terms of service, maintenance, repair work, there is some sale of components to the end user as well. So often companies have a separate channel or, or separate way they treat those components that are being produced to sell to the end customer. Um, and that's called spare parts supply chain or spare parts channel where you know companies sell spare parts to customers as well. So we're not gonna think about that in this lecture because MRP is mostly gonna help us for dependent demand. When you sell spare parts to the end user, um, that is gonna be like independent and demand. So if the end user goes and buys tires because they want to change the tires on their car, then that's independent demand. The end user decided to buy tires. It's not driven by, you know, Toyota or GM's decision to produce a car. Okay. So that is why I'm, I say that, you know, demand for finished goods is often independent demand and demand for components is often dependent demand. It's not always 100% true because end users also buy components and companies can also buy finished goods uh, in some cases. Okay. Um, for example, let's say um, GM buys a Tesla car. Um, to reverse engineer it or something like that, right? So they bought the test. Uh, they bought the Tesla car because maybe they needed it to learn something. It's not like you know the traditional independent demand where a customer buys an end product. Uh, well, I guess you could maybe call it that GM is the the end customer in that case. So I mean, it depends on how you want to classify that. But mostly, for the most part, finished goods demand is independent demand bought by end users and customers, and component uh, demand for components to produce finished goods is called dependent demand. So hopefully this is this is clear. If you look at this picture, read this slide, think about it for a few minutes, I think you'll get the gist of what we're talking about here. Okay. Now, in manufacturing settings or production settings where you're producing finished goods, for producers of finished goods, a lot of decisions they have to make day to day, a lot of inventory they have to handle um, is for components and sub-assemblies. Sub-assemblies is a collection of components put together, but it's not a finished product. So for example, transmission for a car would be like a sub-assembly because it's made for a lot of gears and other parts, um, but it's not an end product, it's not a finished good, you still have to put it in a car, right? So components and sub-assemblies, they deal with a lot of them. And, you know, Oliver made this observation at an APEX meeting in 1970 that even though if you look at the inventory in a manufacturing facility, most of the inventory is of components, most of the books written out there on inventory management deal only with inventory management for independent demand. Very few um, writings out there uh, deal with dependent demand inventory management. And this is kind of, you know, uh, unreasonable or um, 
not proper because there's more components out there in factories than there are finished goods in terms of you know numbers of parts or versions so a car factory may produce 10 models of vehicles and it may have 10,000 components to produce those 10 models so the number of components is a hundred times more than the number of finished goods that you know the models of finished goods they produce and so Oliver's point is that probably because the number you know mostly we're dealing with components um, there should be more literature on managing inventory for components. And that's kind of like the MRP is the answer to that, right? MRP says, I'm going to tell you how to manage inventory of components. Um, I'm not sure I agree 100% with Oliver's comment because in some sense, the reason there's less written on managing inventory of components is because it's more straightforward or a little bit easier to manage inventory of components than finished goods because the demand is dependent the demand depends on your activities when you decide to produce a car you need the components so you know what you're doing you don't have to predict what an outside agent like the customer will do um, so because you know typically there's a lot of variation in independent demand you don't know how customers will react to products and so forth um, that is why a lot of research goes into inventory management for that and less into inventory management for components. In any case, this is, you know, I, I put this quote here because this kind of explains the reason for the existence of material requ requirement planning because material is the components, material you need to build the finished goods. That's the material in MRP, the M, right? And so how do you manage inventory? When do you produce those components? These questions are answered by an MRP system. MRP is a type of resource planning because the material you need to produce the finished goods is one resource. Other resources you might need are manpower, uh, skilled labor, knowledge uh, on how to put things together, uh, you know, a factory or a place to put things together. So there are other resources you need to produce something, but the material, the components that go into uh, producing it that's one type of resource so if you're planning for that type of resource if you generalize that uh, we can call it resource planning so resource planning is a process that takes sales and operations plans snop that we've studied before processes information in the way of time standards routings like which you know stage has to work on a component first before the other and other information on how services or products are produced and then plans the input requirements it plans what resources you need to produce make that production happen a type of resource planning is called mrp material requirements planning um, which uses bill of material data we'll look at bill of material in a, in a short while uh, inventory data and the mass production schedule to calculate requirements for materials which are the dependent demand items the components the sub assemblies um, and to schedule replenishment orders for them so if the definition of mrp does not make a lot of sense right now it will make a lot of sense in another 10 to 12 minutes when you have studied what is the master production schedule what is the bill of materials there are other types of resource planning so there's capacity requirements planning which often follows uh, or or runs in parallel with mrp because if mrp says produce you know ten thousand winter tires or something um you have to check do you have you know capacity to do that what equipment is available can you um, you know can, do you have to get more equipment things like that um, that's sometimes called the feasibility check for an mrp plan that happens as part of mrp as well um, but especially if there's multi-use equipment that is used across multiple components um, then you then crp capacity requirements planning makes a lot of sense where you want to make sure if you are using a machine for component a component b is not expecting to use the machine at the same time you don't have to wait for component a to finish things like that there's DRP, distribution requirements planning, because, you know, uh, finished goods, uh, when you produce them, their inventory is often not stored in just one place. So you finish finished goods, you finish producing finished goods, let's say at um, 
a factory, then you have to move the finished goods to warehouses and retail stores. So that's the distribution part, how much quantity goes there. So DRP says, okay, you're producing 10,000 units at the factory. How many need to go to warehouse A? How many need to go to warehouse B? How many need to go from warehouses to retail stores? How to keep the distribution channel stocked? And what? how many trucks do I need for that? How many containers do I need for that? Um, so think about all the logistics of the finished goods. So that uh, planning is called DRP. Okay, so step one of the master product uh, of MR, doing MRP. So first of all, to, before you do MRP, you have to have a sales and operations plan. So SNOP is kind of like the real step one or step zero a prerequisite. But here, because this lecture is only an MRP, we're assuming we have done SNOP, we have a sales and operations plan, and now we have to go beyond that. So the first plan is to make a master production schedule at the item or SKU level any finished good you want to produce whether it's um, you know a, a laptop with five models model a to model um, e uh, for each model you have to have uh, how much quantity you need based on a sales forecast and then you have to figure out when you when uh, you're going to produce that quantity you're going to produce it in multiple batches one batch and so forth so master production schedule is the next step from sales and operations planning it does two things first sales and operations planning may not have forecasting done at the item level usually it does not because snop as you know will often do forecasting at the product category level or the company level department level or, a, or for a group of products so you have to break that forecast down into forecast for individual products that's you know a part of master production schedule and then for each of those SKUs or individual items for which you now have a forecast we decide which order and which weeks you will produce them in and in what quantities that's master production scheduling okay now the quantities that you decide um, to produce have to kind of have some um, link to what total quantity you have in the sales and operations plan for that product category. So imagine a product category has 10 different SKUs or items, so 10 types of laptops, and the product category is laptops. Then if you are saying, you know, laptop A will sell 50 and laptop B will sell 30 and so on, when you add up these quantities for A, B, C, D, and E, and onwards, you know, for the 10 laptops, the total quantity should equal the quantity in the SNOP uh, plan. Okay, now, so when you make the master production schedule, so you say, okay, you know, I need this many of, you know, laptop A, and I'm going to produce in this week, or this week, or this day. Then you check for the feasibility. Let's say your production capacity is, um, you know, 2,000 laptops a week, and your MPS, master production schedule, has scheduled to produce 2,500 laptops for a week. Well, we know that's not feasible because the MPS is set telling us to produce more than the capacity. So you have to make sure while making the MPS that, you know, things kind of line up. Um, you don't exceed capacity, things like that. So let's look at an example. Okay. So here we have the SNOP, um, Sales and Operations Plan Quantity for the family of chairs. So we need 680 chairs in April, 720 chairs in May. So we'll break up the 720 into products. So we have three types of chairs, <clears throat> kitchen chair, desk chair, dining room chair. Um, and based on historical data or our management intuition, we say, okay, you know, the 720 breaks up into 160, 120, and 440. So we'll take 160 of a kitchen chair, 120 of a desk chair, and because dining rooms are full of chairs, we need lots of dining room chairs, so that's like 440, right? And maybe we recognize that we cannot produce 440 chairs in a week, so we split that over to two weeks okay um, now uh, in in one week we're producing 160 and 220 here so if this was not feasible we could just move 160 down here or move 120 here and the 220s here so we can move things across the four weeks to make sure we don't exceed the capacity of any given week okay uh, same thing we've done for april we've set out the 680 we're going to sell 160 120 200 200 um so 400 dining chairs 120 desk chairs and 160 kitchen chairs so you've broken up <coughs> excuse me the snop quantity into sku level or product level quantities also notice 
um, that we're kind of scheduling dining room chair production back to back so this can eliminate a setup or changeover so if you're producing dining room chairs and if you go to some other chair maybe you have to reset your equipment um, so by setting them back to back you avoid that setup um, we also like this one actually is a mistake i was supposed to put 220 220 here um, so here this would look like that week 5 160 only for kitchen chair week 6 and 7 would be 220 220 for dining room chair and week 8 would be 120 uh, desk chair so it would have the same structure as april um, and if you look at that structure you're only producing one chair in a given week that also is trying to minimize setup so you're saying you know i can't produce um three different chairs in a week because i have to go from chair one to chair two to chair three i have to do setups in between um so i only want to do one setup a week and then you want to produce another chair consecutively whether you want to factor such considerations in your master uh, production schedule or not depends on the setup cost if setup cost is significant you might want to do something like that we're trying to minimize setups if it's you know not a lot or is negligible um, you may be able to ignore it so here's an example um, so now once you have the the, the quantities that you want to produce um, for each product uh, at a certain time um, you then have to do um, make a plan for each product individually so you have to make a plan for the kitchen chair because you're producing 160 then 160 so you have to make sure that you don't run out of kitchen chairs between week one and week five when you're producing 160 kitchen chairs right so we can expand on this plan okay so the way we expand on this plan is we say okay the demand of kitchen chairs for april is 160 you could assume it's going to be constant across the four weeks so 40 40 40 40 um or you may or you may assume that it's going to change and then you can do 40 50 30 however you think it's going to change so this is the required quantity you need in the first row which says gross requirements how much kitchen chair do you need each week you have some inventory on hand right now if you have no inventory that will be starting inventory would be zero but in this example i've just assumed starting inventory is 55. Um, we have certain kitchen chairs that have already been ordered by the customers so they're listed in this row if this is a make to stock situation where you're not getting customer orders before production you just make chairs and put them on the display and hope customers will buy them so in make to stock you'll not have customer orders row this whole row on customer orders will just be deleted if it's a make to stock um, factory or a make to stock situation but if it's make to order in the sense that customers can order before um, you produce then you'll have how much customer orders you've received notice that our production schedule is not just producing for the customer orders received because you know we are in the beginning of week one or just before week one maybe we'll get some more orders in during the week so we are do you have a gross requirement based on the forecast and we are scheduling production based on the forecast because some customers don't order well in advance and so if we just go by customer orders um, we will might run into problems okay now the uh, master production schedule here told us that in week one we will release the order to produce or start production on 160 kitchen chairs in week two we'll start production on dining room chairs right so when you uh, start production it doesn't finish instantaneously there's a lead time so here i've assumed the lead time is one week so we can start production um, for the kitchen chairs in week one the 160 that's the planned order release you receive it's in the receipts this is what you receive you receive the completed chairs in week two so it can be used to satisfy customer orders or the forecasted requirements in week two okay now inventory on hand um is kind of straightforward you just take the previous inventory so if we had 15 chairs left over at the end of week one then the inventory in week two will be 15 minus the expected you know usage which is the requirements minus 40 plus what you're going to receive in that week 160 that'll give you 135 so 15 minus 40 plus 160 notice i'm not using 27 here because i expect to get more customer orders between now and end of week two so i expect the 27 to increase all the way up to 40 because my forecast is kind of 40. 
okay so that's how you project your inventory forward you just subtract the forecasted amount or the gross requirements and you add anything you receive so notice that the inventory hand goes down goes down goes down by 40 each time until you get a until you receive a production quantity with that you've produced and then the inventory goes up and then it keeps going down again okay now an interesting quantity that mrp or uh, systems often give us is called available to promise atp available to promise is inventory that we are we have scheduled to produce but we don't have a customer order for remember if we only schedule production for firm booked customer orders um, because production lead time may be longer than the lead time the cost um, then um, the lead time the customer is willing to wait for uh, we may schedule production based on our forecast and so available to promise tells us that okay you've scheduled production for 100 you received customer orders for 70 so you have 30 which is a quantity which has a scheduled production but has no sales yet so you're available to promise is 30. so if a customer calls the salesperson and says hey i need a you know 15 chairs pronto the salesperson can say don't worry we, it's in our scheduled production and nobody has laid claim to it so i can sell you up to 30 chairs no problem so you'll get them in two weeks when the production finishes or whatever right and remember the mrp's roots are in component and sub-assembly manufacturing often done in batches i'll talk about towards the end of the lecture you know how mrp came about what are the limitations of mrp but its roots are in you know manufacturing uh, a large number of components often in batches um, and so in that sort of environment you know an oem manufacturer let's say like gm or toyota will call up a supplier and say i need you know um, 200 transmissions and then the supplier, uh, you know, may have scheduled production of 200 transmissions, but 80 may already have been booked by some other customer or by the same customer in an earlier date. Um, and so the supplier might say, okay, I have available to promises 120 for the next week. Um, so in my next week's production run, I, I already booked 80 for somebody else. So I'll give you the 120 and then the remaining 80, I'll give you the next week in the next week's production run. So that's where the idea of available to promise comes in. You know, often salespeople who receive customer inquiries for orders um, will need to know what's the available to promise uh, quantity so they can tell the customer how much, you know, because you can sell the available to promise inventory without having to change your production schedule. And production schedules are costly to change in the short run, which is why ATP is an important metric, especially input especially for sales um, because they know that they can get customer orders for ATP and if ATP is too large they have a lot of available to promise inventory the sales stuff will often scramble try to get some orders in because the production is scheduled you don't want to produce and just keep something um, in inventory for a long time and so um, ATP is uh, often how sales and manufacturing would interact in these uh, factories which make components and sub assemblies and so forth or you know even finished uh, goods that are being ordered by retailers and so forth so hopefully you can understand the table you know i've told you how different quantities are computed uh, the gross requirements row comes from your sales forecast um it's not it may not exactly be the sales forecast um uh, in the sense that you may say okay my sales forecast is 30 for this month but i want to uh, 30 per week in this week but i want to produce 40 because i'm trying to build some finished goods inventory um you know um for a, an expected increase in sales or something so there could be reasons where the gross requirements are different than the forecast you're trying to build extra inventory uh, ex or you're expecting a large customer order or you know that you have a lot of forecast errors so you've added a, 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 some quantity to the forecast because you want to overproduce a little bit to have some safety stock so that's why i don't like to you know some books will call this row forecast quantity but i don't like that because there are reasons when this quantity may be larger than the forecast quantity or maybe smaller you might realize that some customer orders are not firm and you're going to get some cancellation so if you know the forecast says 50 but you know that you're going to get five cancellations so might as well just produce 45 or you expect you know some cancellations things like that so there are reasons where the requirement required quantity could be 
different than the forecast for you know some of the examples I've given you. Um, and so I like to call it the requirements, the required quantity you need uh, rather than just the forecast, although you know many cases is the forecast is used here. Now um, you know usually it's not a good idea to um, simply just produce exactly the forecast because you know there is a chance that you may have demand over the forecast so do you want to keep some safety stock things like that so you may you know pad up the forecast to to have the required quantity in any case that's the required quantity that just is given to us customer orders is given to us that sales tells us this much quantity customers have booked they're going to pick up in week one week two week three uh, planned order releases come from the master production schedule which this is a part of as well so master production schedule is where we decided how much to produce right we try to minimize setups or whatever else we're trying to do here so that comes from there receipts is easy you just take the uh, order release that comes from the mps master production schedule of the uh, item I mean, this is part of the mass production schedule, but you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, this part where you decide which week you're gonna release the order for a certain quantity of each item, um, you get that from here. You move it over by the lead time, and you get receipts. So if you order 160 uh, share production in week one, and the lead time is one week, ta-da, you receive them in week two. If the lead time was two weeks, you'll get receive them in week three, and so on. Okay. Now companies might do it on daily basis, like days instead of weeks, because um, what if the lead time is 1.5 weeks, right? So days may make more sense in doing so, uh, planning like that, but you know, I just don't have enough real estate on the PowerPoint and I just want to teach you the concept and the idea behind it, not necessarily uh, that this is exactly what you would do on a weekly basis. You might do MRP uh, for days, day one, day two, day three, like that. And so if the lead time was three days, you might receive it after three days and so on. Inventory on hand is easy. You take the starting inventory for the first column. Starting inventory is given to you. For the second column on, you take the previous column's uh, inventory on hand as a starting inventory. Um, you add whatever you expect to receive that week and you subtract whatever you expect to sell, which is going to be the requirements, not the orders booked because these could go up over time um, by the time you get to this day or week. right? And then you get the new inventory on hand projected. Available to promise is also easy to compute you take inventory on hand for that column so for the 17 uh, you your inventory for the beginning of that time period so for the 17 the inventory at the beginning of week one is 55 that's your starting inventory you take that and then you subtract all the confirmed customer orders until you receive the next um, batch of, pro of, of of this product so we receive the next batch of 160 of this product in week two all the customer orders up to week two are just 38 so 55 minus 38 means 70 so of the 55 we have only 38 has been booked so available to promise is 17 okay now let's go to the second column what is the inventory on hand here well the ending inventory of week one which is 15 um, is um, our starting inventory okay and so total orders uh oh no so we're not going to use the starting inventory in week two and we get a receipt because in uh, for most weeks when you have something received um you are going to use the received quantity because you have this 160 right here okay and total orders of this 160 total um orders booked till next received at 27 plus 28 plus eight uh, plus zero this is zero it's empty so before you get the next 160 you have only 59 quantity booked so the 160 minus the 59 will give you that available to promise is 101 okay um, in week two okay okay in this week So, I mean, as long as you understand the basic idea, um, you know, inventory on hand and available to promise are very similar. Um, the main difference is inventory on hand is based off the forecast. You subtract the forecast. You expect you all the, the requirements. You expect you will sell the requirements or that will be used up. And for available to promise, you just use the customer orders booked. Okay. 
As long as customer orders booked not do not change, are available to promise will stay one one. As more customer orders are ad added here, the available to promise will fall. So until um, you receive the next shipment or more orders are booked, ATP will stay the same. So one one. Um, and uh, in week two, but if you get more customer orders, like the eight becomes ten or twenty four becomes thirty, then this would kind of go down. Okay. So I don't I don't make you do these calculations because usually you know computer systems do these uh, tables. You can get reports out of an MRP system, but you need to be able to read a table like this and kind of understand what's happening. So you need to be able to interpret it. I mean, if uh, if you, if you are asked to compute, you know, like inventory on hand or something, I expect you to be able to look at this example and kind of figure it out. So if there's one or two values missing, you can look at the rest of the table and figure this out. So uh, it's not, it looks kind of complicated, but if you think about it and you look at an example, it's, it's not that bad. Okay, now the master production schedule um, is the basis of um, all of these order releases, which are you know orders released to production to produce an item. Um, and then once we go to the component level, the orders may be released to a supplier to say, okay, supply me, you know, this much uh, stuff. Right, so could be to the supplier. Could you... So because production schedules are expensive to change, let's say you place an order with a supplier for a component that was the based on order release from the mps mass production schedule and then after a week you tell the supplier hey i need less that was a wrong order um, then uh, you know the supplier it may cost him because he may have already scheduled production or denied other other customers of his and so on right so often for a master production schedule, we'll say, okay, for the next four weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks, the production schedule is frozen. We are not going to make any changes to it. And then from 12, you know, for the next few weeks after that, it's slushy. So maybe we can change quantities plus minus 20%, but we can't just produce a product we were not producing uh, or stop production of an, of an item we were planning to produce completely. And then beyond that is liquid, we can make any change. We can move product in or out of the production schedule, change quantity and so on. So here's an example of time fences. You can see frozen slushy liquid, that's time period. So eight weeks is frozen in this example. Slushy is weeks nine to 15, liquid is week 16 to 26. Now you can see that for the frozen time period, most of the demand is from customer orders. So the capacity here is being used up to produce from customer orders. And the slushy is kind of mixed, and in the liquid, it's, uh, there's very few from customer orders. <clears throat> this would be like a make to order situation where customer places an order four, five, six, eight, twelve 12 weeks in advance. Um, and that's why you have from customer orders up to 8 weeks, 15 weeks, and so on. If it's for the make to stock situation, then you wouldn't have firm customer orders. What would you what you would have would be more reliable short term forecast. So you might freeze for up to four weeks, six weeks, and maybe you trust your forecast for the next four to six weeks, and then the forecast is very unreliable beyond that, and then you get you know slushy and liquid time fences. Okay, available to promise quantity is also being shown on the screen because that is a difference between the uh, master production schedule, the scheduled quantity, and the firm customer orders. So you look at the scheduled quantity to produce, you subtract the firm customer orders, and then the remaining production um, is or capacity is available uh, to promise. So if you look at this uh, black bar at the top, black line at the top, the distance from the black line to the red line is your available to promise. So in week eight, available to promise is very small, right? About this much quantity at the top between the red line and the black horizontal line. And in week 15, the available to promise is about half of your capacity is available to promise. Now let's talk about bill of materials. Bill of materials uh, is uh, a 
provides details of which components and sub-assemblies are being used to make a product. If a sub-assembly is being used, which components make up the sub-assembly, uh, and what are the relationships, which components go to which sub-assembly, which sub-assembly goes where. So you can see this tree structure on the right, which is called product structure tree or parent component relationships, where a ladder back chair is composed of a ladder back sub-assembly, uh, B and one indicates quantity one if that is required. A seat subassembly, which is item C, uh, only one of that is required. Front legs, which is two of them, and leg supports, which is four of them. Now, in the ladder back subassembly, you have back slats, which is four of them, and two back legs, which go into here. The seat subassembly has a seat frame and a seat cushion. The seat frame has four seat frame bolts. So this tree structure tells you which component goes where, which sub-assembly goes where, how many of those you need to make one ladder back chair. So this all is contained in the bill of materials. Now the chair, if you sell it to end customer, that is independent demand, and then the components have dependent demand because you need the components when you decide to make a chair in the factory. <clears throat> the master production level at item level is exploded uh, to the component and sub-assembly levels by using the bill of materials. So once you have, you know, a table like this, this is for kitchen chair. Uh, let's assume this was for ladder back chair. Then this table, you'll take uh, the gross requirements, let's say they're 40, uh, and then you'll say, okay, I need two front legs plus ladder back chair. So the 40 becomes 80 for front legs. So you make a similar table for 80, where the requirements, instead of being 40 each week, are 80 each week because you need two front legs to make the chair. And so for each component, um, you get a table like that. So that's why there's an explosion because you had one master production schedule table for an item like a chair, and now that one table is becoming multiple tables one table for each component. The result is a schedule for each component and subassembly in the bill of materials, and then orders are released either to production for subassemblies and components made in house, or the orders are being released from those tables to suppliers if the components are purchased for from suppliers. Okay. Inventory on hand data and lead time data for each component is required to accomplish this because remember in this table we had inventory, starting inventory, and then we computed inventory on hand, and then we also need the lead time was one week. So for each component, we'll need to know what is the lead time if you're buying it from a supplier and so on. This is an example where the seat subassembly is exploded down to seat frames and seat cushions, the two tables there, and then you know you can see that the <clears throat> um uh, lot size uh, is different, it's 230 for seat subassembly, but seat frames, lot size is 300. Um, the seat cushion has a different, um, because the planned order release is 230 here, the 230 becomes the requirement for the components. So at uh, when you do the MRP explosion, when you're releasing the orders, uh, for the uh, for something to be built like a seat sub assembly you need 230 of them built then 230 of them require 230 seat frames and 230 seat cushions and 230 seat frames actually require two uh, require multi more than one uh, seat frame board so the 230 here to make that you're going to be needing 300 well you're going to be you, to meet the gross requirements of 230, you're going to be needing 300. Uh, you're going to be producing in a lot size of 300 because your lot size is 300. So you're going to release an order for 300 seat frames. That order for 300 seat frames is going to be multiplied by four when it goes to seat frame boards because each seat frame needs four seat frame boards. So you can see the MRP explosion happening where the order releases at each uh, level are multiplied by how many components are required to make that sub-assembly when you go to the next level in the product structure tree. So you can see this tree right here as you do the MRP explosion um, you get order releases at a higher level become the requirement for a lower level. Uh, so right here order release of 230 here becomes a gross requirement at the lower level um, and you the usage quantity you multiply that by that when you get the requirements. So the requirements here of 1200 are coming from 300 order release multiplied by four because you need four seat frame boards to make one seat frame. And that's how you got the 1200 here.
Okay, so MRP, you know, generates all of these tables for you. So it's basically, in some sense, MRP is a computational device which uses the bill of materials, uses the master production schedule, and um, uses the lead time and inventory data to come up with production or ordering schedules for all sorts of components, and it maintains the relationships uh, given in the bill of materials. Some MRP considerations. So whenever we're doing, you know, MRP is making these tables, it needs to know what order size to use. I should I order, you know, here, how do we know we need to order 230? Here for seed frames, how do we know we need to order 300, right? Um, and so there are multiple policies you can use here. One is a fixed order quantity. It's kind of like an economic order quantity. Sometimes you use the EOQ formula to compute the fixed order quantity, and there the order quantity is fixed. So if you look at this example, all right, this is a fixed order quantity example because you order 230, 230 each time, okay? Um, <clears throat> the other option is a periodic order quantity where you fix the time interval. You're going to place an order every two weeks or every four weeks or every two months. So the time interval is fixed, but the order quantity is not fixed. Each time when you have to place the order, uh, you figure out how much quantity you need to, for the next two months. So if you're ordering every bi-monthly every two months, Every two months, you decide, okay, I need this much quantity to be good for the next two months. So the FOQ and POQ are very similar to the continuous review inventory management system and the periodic review inventory management system. Remember, in continuous review, you always order uh, Q. The order quantity is Q or EOQ quantity, whereas in periodic review, the period is fixed after every so many days or weeks. You check the inventory and then you order uh, whatever amount is sufficient. So these are variations of those ideas. Fixed order quantity is a variation of the EOQ idea. The periodic order quantity is the variation of periodic inventory management, uh, but applied to MRP. Okay, lot for lot is the special case of periodic order quantity where the period is one. So every time period, you're ordering just for the next time period. Why do we have lot for lot? It kind of aligns well with GIT idea, just in time idea. Just produce uh, enough for just like the next week and the next week produce enough for the next week and so forth. So the LO, L4L is used to keep inventory levels very low. It's appropriate when you have very expensive items or items that expire quickly. Uh, you don't want to produce a large batch and just hold them in stock. So there are, you know, lot for lot is sometimes used. Periodic order quantity is useful when you want to have um, some components uh, delivered at the same time together. Maybe you want to put them in the same truck for transport efficiencies. Um, maybe you have a bunch of supplies in that country and you can process the uh, customs documentation together for those items and so you want to order them together. So every week, every five days, maybe you check um, how much you need for the next week and then you order, release orders for a bunch of items together because they're all uh, on periodic order quantity, for example. So very similar logic to what we studied in inventory management. Now, for safety stock is a little bit, um, you know, you have to be a little bit thoughtful here. Now, when we make the master production schedule, as I mentioned, the the gross requirements don't have to equal the forecast. We may inflate the forecast for safety stock reasons. We may inflate the forecast to build up inventory before a huge selling season like Christmas or holiday season comes up, right? Um, and so the gross requirements in the master production schedule do not have to match up with the forecast precisely. They're based off the forecast, but they have to be one-to-one -to -one match, right? And so we can build safety stock just into our SNOP plan. In the SNOP plan, we can say, you know, produce enough that your inventory doesn't go to zero or doesn't go to this low level. Now, um, so we have we have safety stock already built into the finished goods uh, plan um, or forecast or requirement. Um, and so should we have safety stock in MRP? Because, you know, if we produce to those requirements, that already puts gives us some safety stock at the finished goods level. Right. Well, what happens is that SNOP will often not account for lead time variations at the component levels um, that put some components will be harder to get or take longer because the supplies are far away or supply disruptions for certain components. And for this reason, sometimes you may want to maintain higher safety stock for some components uh, higher than what you need just to produce the finished goods. So let's say, you know, you have some safety stock of finished goods. So you produce a thousand a week and maybe you maintain 100 or 200 extra of the finished goods as safety stock. So if you just do MR, regular MRP, uh, you'll just have enough components to produce a thousand a week. 
But let's say some components are hard to get or, or you know, have, are more prone to supply disruptions. You may tell the MRP system that for these particular components, you know, buy enough components, not just to produce a thousand finished goods, but maybe to produce 1500 finished goods, because they're always going to have some on hand extra because this component does get uh, disruptions or does go out of stock often or becomes hard to acquire sometimes. So I don't want my production to be disrupted. So for that reason, um, you can uh, adjust quantities in the MRP. You can adjust them by order sizes, how much to order. You can adjust them uh, in terms of a minimum inventory on hand level. So if inventory on hand should not fall below this level, so make sure you release enough orders that inventory on hand stays higher than this quantity. Things like that, you can, you know, you can apply those ideas to MRP um, when it does the bill of materials explosion and makes all those tables for each component. Um, you can put such conditions in to make sure certain components you have lots of inventory of. Okay, so you may have the safety stock considerations. Then another uh, thing you may want to think about is, well, MRP is going to tell you when to produce each component. It's kind of guiding your inventory and production decisions for all the components, all the dependent, de dependent demand items. Um, and so all of those decisions also reflect the activity that happens in the factory and the costs that are incurred. So, um, you what you want to do is uh, maybe you want to link that to the cost data and the cash requirements and so forth. So MRP two uh, version two of MRP does that extension. So MRP two was created to tie in the cost data and the the finance requirements or the cash requirements into MRP. So when MRP explosion happens, you can run that report and see, okay, how much money do I need to to um, fund my operations for the next year, week or month, and you know, fund my production. How much raw material I need to buy? How much components I need to buy? What is it going to cost me? So it ties these production activities in using cost data into the financial and accounting system and it can help you manage the money aspect of the operation okay now mrp2 is a precursor to erp because mrp2 is combining finance and accounting with production um, and then erp takes it even more and then connects hr and sales and other systems together as well this is an example of an ERP system. So ERP system will have some data about costing, have some human resource data, sales and marketing data, sales, pricing, customer data, uh, forecasting, purchasing, distribution from supply chain, accounts payable from accounts and finance, things like that. And then in manufacturing, you'll see the MRP material requirements planning and then the scheduling system. So ERP you know, is even more expensive than MRP2 where it kind of connects all activities in a company and all resources in a company into one IT system. So MRP used to be its own software, but often now when you get an ERP system, MRP is one of the modules in an ERP system. Okay, so we've talked about, you know, how MRP takes forecast for independent demand items like cars or chairs and then uses them first to make a master production schedule at the item level and then uses the bill of materials to do what is called the bill of materials explosion to make all the tables um, which regulate orders releases um, for all the components and sub-assemblies. In that way, MRP controls uh, the production and inventory of all the components and sub-assemblies. And usually, traditionally, historically, it is set up to produce components just in time. Components are produced and delivered just when they are needed for the fin final good to be produced. Okay. There are um, criticisms of MRP. There are people who don't like MRP. Um, and I want to review some of them, so I don't want you to get the idea that MRP is the best thing since sliced bread and it should always be used in its original form. Um, you need to understand what are its limitations as well. The first thing is that MRP is kind of, because it comes out of the batch processing um, environment, it kind of 
propagates that. So if you think about a finished goods, think about uh, you know bicycles shown on the left in this chart. Um, the red line shows you the reorder point. The blue line shows you the inventory of bicycles. So the inventory of the finished good goes down. When it goes below the reorder point, you start production of a batch, and then the inventory goes up when the batch is produced, and then the inventory goes down again, right? Um, if you look at the slope of how the inventory falls, the demand for bicycles is pretty steady. It's not you know, changing drastically, the blue line is falling almost at a constant rate, right? But then whenever the inventory falls below the reorder point and you place a production order for the, the, the bicycle, that production order for the bicycle becomes the requirement in a master production schedule, which then explodes to all the components and then the rims, which are the components of the bicycle, um, get ordered based on those um, orders the reorders you do for the bicycle now bicycle invent uh, graph the demand for the bicycles was relatively stable but look at the demand for rims you have zero demand on day one and two and on day three you get a demand of you know or week three um, you get a demand of 2000 rims the blue ball jumps up and again it's zero 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 for a while then it jumps up to 2000 so it's very lumpy variable demand so MRP system, um, you know, is because it's not taking into account the entire supply chain. It's just placing orders uh, in lots or batches to the supplier and giving lumpy uh, demand to the supplier. You know, the supplier gets no demand for a while, then it gets a big batch to produce, then no demand for a while, then a big batch to produce. Okay, that was how batch manufacturing or batch processing used to happen. But we know that line processes are more efficient, and so MRP is just kind of st stuck with that batch processing mindset because it just releases orders for large you know to produce a batch of product based on the production requirements of the finished goods or what would be an alternative for example here alternative would be that you know you tell your suppliers okay um, my average demand is about 100 bicycles a day so i'm gonna produce about 100 bicycles a day so you just make 100 rims a day and then you locate close to me um, or we get, you know, what's the most efficient transportation method? We ship container fulls of rims or truckloads of rims and you produce 100 rims a day and whenever you fill up a truck or a container, you ship it to me. Or if you're close to me, you can just deliver rims at the end of each day, just deliver 100 rims a day to my factory. And so the rims and the bicycles get produced at a relatively constant rate day in, day out, rather than doing these massive batch production and then doing something else or nothing for a few days and then doing a massive batch and so on, right? So that'll be the lean idea where you smooth out production um, and you avoid big batches and you try to go to a line or assembly line type of process. But MRP, because of its roots in, roots in batch processing, you know, tends to, to generate lumpy demand for components where you're not producing a component for weeks and certainly you get a dim, huge order for a component. The uh, Another issue with the MRP is sometimes called MRP nervousness, which means that if you have a huge big product structure tree so in, the, in this example in the tree 101 is the sku number for the finished good now to make 101 you need 201 203 204 to make 203 you need 302 to make 302 you need 403 to make 201 you need 301 to make 301 you need 402 to make 402 you need 501p so there are five levels to this tree structure so small quantity changes at 101 can sometimes result in large component changes. Imagine a component that is used for many some assemblies and other components. So imagine something like a screw or a fastener. And maybe in like, you know, hundreds of places in your complicated product, you use that fastener or screw. So you change the product quantity of the finished good, like plus minus 10%, and suddenly the component orders for the fasteners just change drastically. Maybe you need three times or five times or 50% you know, or a huge change in the fastness required because even, um, you know, a small change in the quantity at the item level gets multiplied. You need, you know, two fasteners here, three there, four there, that gets multiplied by that factor. And suddenly you need, you know, 20,000 more fasteners, even though you change the finished good quantity only by 100. Um, and so it's kind of like the bullwhip effect, but it's just not the bullwhip along the supply chain. It's bullwhip down the, the product structure tree. 
where small changes in the finished code can lead to big changes for certain components, right? And so that is also problematic because components are also being manufactured by some company and that company does not like big changes in their production schedule or the customer orders, right? So if you take the whole supply chain perspective where you care about what happens to the supplier as well because supplier costs eventually become your cost, um, you want, don't want to avoid big changes for your suppliers as well. Um, and so MRP, because it only produces components as needed, um, can, is sometimes more susceptible to this MRP nervousness where small changes in the production schedule of finished goods lead to big changes in components required, uh, pr pr component orders placed. Um, other issues with MRP, which is like the summary of the no MRP argument, you know, which is what, you know, some companies or managers like, they don't like any MRP, uh, they don't like to use the MRP system. Um, one of the first one I've already, I already told you about the batch processing issue, right, where components are produced in large batches and so on. So Lean replaces that structure with efficient assembly line production for all components and sub-assemblies. If you go back to the assembly line that was kind of invented by Henry Ford for the Model T, um, uh, the Ford Model T car, uh, in Henry Ford's Model T production line, the assembly of the Model T was happening on an assembly line process, but the rims, the wheels, the other components were being produced in large batches. So in that sort of setup, MRP made a lot of sense, and that's how traditional manufacturing happened. You, you placed orders with suppliers of components. You were not tightly integrated with the suppliers. You couldn't look into how much inventory they had, what systems they had. Um, you just, it was a very formal transactional relationship you place an order they ship through the order and so components were being manufactured in large batches and then the final assembly happened on an assembly line lean said that's not good enough let's take the assembly line back along the supply chain let's have all the components being made on assembly lines feeding the assembly line to many to assemble the car so the car assembly line gets fed by hundreds of other assembly lines making different components so let's make everything into an assembly line, smooth flows of product from raw materials to components to sub-assemblies to product, um, you know, constant rate of production or relatively concentrate rate of production instead of doing no production of one product and a lot of production of the next order, what they call hijinka or line balancing and other ideas in lean, um, they go for a different system altogether. If you go for a different system altogether, MRP becomes much less relevant in this new system um, than it used to be. And you use Kanban to give signals to start, stop, to, to, to you know, adjust the production levels of different components. Um, and you have just like one big assembly. You can think of the entire production from raw material to finished wood as one big assembly line, um, which is kind of like a fishbone where you have the assembly line to make the final product being fed into by other assembly lines, but it's like one big system. So you, so you don't accept the boundaries between companies. You say, okay, let's look at the whole supply chain and let's optimize the whole supply chain and produce things at a relatively constant rate so the whole supply chain hums along at the same speed versus doing this batch or ordering of large batches and production of components in large batches. Now, the second point on this slide is extremely important. Because of MRP nervousness, which we talked about, small changes in the production schedule at the top of the product structure tree can lead to big changes for components. Um, you need to avoid changes of the production schedule, at least in the short term. How do you avoid changes in the production schedule? The only way you avoid changes in the production schedule is if you know demand really well in the near term, which means you have highly accurate forecasts. The problem with forecasts is even if you're able to get a highly accurate forecast at the company level, the company sales, or a product category level, the product category sales, it is really, really hard to get accurate item level forecast. The more you disaggregate the forecasting level, the more lower level you go. So instead of company level, instead of department level, instead of state or country level, to go down to individual SKUs, how much does this particular SKU is going to sell in the next eight months, the less accurate your forecasts become. And for MRP to be successful, it needs accurate item level forecasts, SKU level forecasts, right? 
those forecasts are very hard to achieve. So in a way, MRP is premised, the success of MRP is premised on something that is very hard to achieve. So if MRP fails, and there have been you know, companies which have not done well with MRP, and then they've gotten rid of MRP, um, when MRP fails, one of the key reasons is often that that company is just unable to have accurate item level forecast. And it's not just the company's fault, item level accurate forecasts are really, really hard. And in many situations, in uh, not feasible right um even if a company that does a good job of forecasting at the category and company level the item level forecasts are going to have forecast error and that's going to lead to changes in production schedules that's going to lead to mrp nervousness and all sorts of you know changes needed at the component level and the, your component supplies are going to be be mad at you because you keep changing your orders to them the third criticism on the slide is that MRP is overly concerned with inventory costs. It's not looking at um, the whole supply chain and all the activities in the supply chain. It's just saying, let me do just in time on inventory. I only want to produce components exactly when I need them. I only want components delivered when I need them to make the final product. And so it's just super micromanaging the component inventory at the, at the cost of uh, ignoring the whole supply chain and trying to m macro optimize or global optimize the supply chain, right? Now, in the real life, lead times can be unpredictable. So your supplier says four weeks, but the you know transportation delays, strikes, port congestion, uh, COVID disruptions, all sorts of issues happen where you can't trust the lead time the supplier tells you because the transportation will mess up or the supply will be delayed or something will happen. So what do you do in MRP? You say, okay, my, the supplier told me lead time is four weeks, but I'm going to put in a lead time of seven weeks in, into the MRP system. So I have a three week buffer. So even if products arrives late, um, my whole production is not held up because my components are going to, you know, uh, even if they're late, I because I scheduled for a seven week lead time, even if they arrive in four, five, six weeks, I'm still fine as long as they don't take more than seven weeks. So what ends up happening is that MRP that was trying to save inventory costs, trying to be just in time of inventory because it's so susceptible um, to delays in and, and longer than, than listed lead times. Often people, when they're using MRP, they end up adding a lot of buffer to the lead times. And so if you are ordering everything with a lead time of four weeks, with a lead time of seven weeks, on average, stuff is going to arrive two to three weeks early. And if stuff starts arriving two to three weeks early, you've just diluted the entire advantage of MRP to be just in time on inventory, right? So what's the point in trying to optimize inventory and be just in time when you're just adding buffer or extra time to your lead times and getting stuff early just in case? You're just at back at the same spot where you could just have had a bunch of safety stock in the first place and done it through some other inventory management system like safety stock reorder point system and not done MRP, right? Because you could do reorder point system for components and just have components reordered when the inventory runs low, do Kanban systems or have suppliers look at close to you and things like that and have, you know, um, steady production of components based on your usage rates and things like that. There are alternatives you could have done. The only, well, one of the main reasons you did MRP was you said, I want to be just in time on my components, only order components when I need them, and they should arrive just before I need to use them to make a final product. But then because lead times are unreliable, you end up ordering them with, you know, um, lead times that are uh, inflated, and then you just got rid of the whole advantage of just in time inventory. Um, the other criticism with MRP, you know, some of them are more like you can work around them, some of them you can't. So one of the ones is that MRP only orders components when it needs them. So imagine a component is hard to get and you don't need it right now because you're not producing a finished good that needs it right now. Um, but if it's on sale or available right now, you might order it for the future. In real life, we do it all the time, right? Um, you know, people who make computers... Um, especially gaming rigs know this very well because um, until very recently, um, GPUs, graphical processing units, those expensive cards that make your video games look really nice on a computer were hard to find. So sometimes even if you didn't really need a GPU, you just bought it because, you know, it, you might as well get it because it's in hard supply and then you're going to upgrade your system or you're going to sell it to a friend or, you know, you can do something else with it, uh, give it to somebody else. 
or when you do want to upgrade your system you at least have the gpu that you wanted because it's not easily available right or in real life you might say you know today eggs are on sale i usually buy eggs for a week i'm going to buy eggs for three weeks today right um, so when things are hard to get or on sale or for other reasons you might you may buy components that you don't need this week or next week but mrp doesn't do any of that mrp only orders components when they're needed to produce something uh, and only orders them you know with the lead time um, factored in so it does not even if you're running low on certain components until the order for finished goods come in you're not going to order them reorder them so let's let me give you another example let's say you make a certain type of bicycle that uses special rims they're harder or they're lighter and the special bicycle has not been ordered in a while and you're running low on those special rims so in mrp you're not going to reorder them because mrp will only reorder them once you schedule production of this special bicycle now suddenly you know you get some orders for the special bicycle so you start to make your massive production schedule you schedule production and then mrp orders those special rims but voila you know as it turns out the special rims uh, suppliers are not supplying right now because that material is in short supply and because you never bought the rims kind of just in case or to have safety stock before now that you do have demand for that special bicycle and you try to be just in time on the special rims which are hard to get um, you're now delayed right so mrp does not issue early warnings for stock and that is important for critical components or components which are in hard short supply um, to order them early even if you don't need them immediately since delays can hold the production of finished items this i already talked about often lead times are overestimated in mrp and so you just you know um, you try to be just in time but you're not being just in time because you're just trying to add buffer on the lead time and order earlier than you need them in any case because there's variability around lead times then orders for uh, the mrp system and it generates orders for components like it will uh, uh, print out a report or output a report with a list of orders order this component in this quantity uh, this week and then next week it will generate another report for the orders that week or that day and so forth all of those orders are being generated by the mrp production scheduling and the b uh, the bill of materials explosion and there's no priority there's no that like we need these orders before others because all of them have high priority all of them are required to produce the final product you're only ordering what you need so there's no prioritization for critical components or components in short supply or things like that um, mrp is most helpful in an environment that's according to many people is not ideal to begin with and i kind of touched on this before so mrp shines it does really well in batch production environments especially where components are being batch produced even if final assembly is on an assembly line so for henry ford's model t assembly line mrp would there were no computers back then but if there was even like a small computer they would have you know been really overjoyed to have mrp to have really shown and done well in that environment Right. so because you're assuming relationship with suppliers are transactional you just place an order and you receive quantity after lead time uh, time elapses and components are delivered in batches and you produce you know the supplies produce in batches and you do all of that uh, and you run mrp and you are a happy duck okay but the point is that is that the ideal state to be in in the first place and lean suggests no that is not an ideal place to be in in the first place so the whole reason for MRTP to exist is eroded a little bit by by lean methodologies now somebody might say whenever you have to produce a finished good you have to do the BOM explosion you have to figure out how much of the components you need to produce finished good and that is true that calculation happens in lean as well if you start on a lean assembly line for a Toyota Camry if you say okay I'm going to produce 100 Camrys today um, obviously that 100 gets multiplied by 4 and you need 400 tires to put on the 100 Camrys right um, so as the as you set production rates in lean for different components and for their suppliers assembly lines you multiply by how many components you need so one camry is four tires or five if there's an extra tire in the trunk or something you know one camry is one um is two sets of vipers uh, so each if you're producing 100 cameras you need 200 viper blades or whatever right things like that or two headlights so 100 cameras is 200 headlights lamps and so forth so you do that multiplication and bom explosion anyway even in lean when you set the production rates for different assembly lines for different components that feed into your assembly line for the final assembly and so forth um, and so 
if MRP is just a BOM explosion, well, nobody has an issue with that because you have to multiply by how many components you need per finished good when you decide on production rates and so forth. But um, you know, that is not what MRP is. MRP is that you set up a master production schedule and you only produce components when you need them. So you order them just in time and you put, order them in batches based on your production quantities and so forth, right? Um, so, uh, you know, there there's this thinking that maybe the batch component production that kind of happens with MRP is perhaps not the best system. Okay, so that is it for the MRP lecture. There's a lot of concepts on this lecture. You know, not a whole, not a whole lot of calculation you need to be worried about. Um, you just need to understand, you know, the the ideas behind what is MRP, what is MRP two do, what is BOM explosion, what is bill of materials, what are time fences. So, so go through the slides, and if you if if something is amiss, you don't understand some of those slides, just rewatch the lecture. Um, it's an important tool. It's used a lot in industry still. Um, there are variations on it. Um, some companies don't use it, some use it. So it's important to understand what it is, what it does well, um, and understand bill of materials, understand all of these concepts. They're very critical to understanding of supply chain management. If you uh, graduated, went to a job interview, and you didn't know what MRP was, you didn't know what a bill of materials was, you didn't know what a master production schedule was, well, you wouldn't get very far. People will think you don't know what you're doing. Um, and so this, uh, conceptually, is a very important lecture. All of the concepts we talked about are really important and uh, to be able to be an informed supply chain practitioner, you need to understand these um, um, concepts.